All right, good morning, everyone. So, a few words uh, about who I am. So, I'm Ksenia Pigero, Dmitriva, I don't know, somewhere in between. Just recently changed my last name, so I'm still finding, figuring out. Um, principal consultant at Synopsys, uh, previously a company known as Digital. We were acquired a few months ago, so again, that's kind of a new name. Uh, I've been in application security for over seven years, where I started as an intern, and you know, now I'm principal consultant. Um, before that, I was a developer um, in technology called Flash that existed seven years ago. It kind of still exists, but not really. I was a Java developer before that. Uh, and I do speak at conferences quite often, at security conferences, uh, such as RSA, AppSec, EU. I spoke in besides London a few years ago and some other American conferences. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, at Ksenia Dmitrieva where this is my professional account, so they're not going to be, you know, pictures of food or something like that. <laughs> and in my real life, I do ballroom dancing. So that's my passion and love. So today we will be talking about AngularJS, because in the past couple of years, I was really, really interested in JavaScript technologies. And so one of the main, um, kind of one of the most popular client side frameworks is AngularJS. So I was looking at the vulnerabilities, how secure it is, how vulnerable it is, what can go wrong when you're using Angular. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We'll give you a quick intro, and then we will talk about what a, how Angular relates to OWASP Top 10. Um, we'll talk about the security controls that are built into Angular by default, kind of out of the box how you can enable some of them or disable some of them as a developer. And then we'll talk about the security issues that are unfortunately still present in the framework. Like what, what are the vulnerabilities? What are the zero days? What are the mistakes that developers can make to make your applications vulnerable? Um, and then I will show you demos of some of the vulns that we'll be talking about. So, anybody heard of Angular? Awesome. Then I don't need to give an intro. You guys are going to give me an intro. And since we are in the university, uh, how do teachers usually start a class? With a pop quiz. <laughs> so uh, I have some questions for you guys. I'm going to be throwing candy. Candy contains peanuts, so if you're allergic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't catch it. Give it to somebody else. Don't touch it. But if, you, if you're not, then good. So what is AngularJS? Application framework for the web. All right. Anything else about Angular? What kind of application framework? Okay. Okay. No <laughs> throwing. So it's a front end, and as I said, it is JavaScript, right? So it's front end uh, application framework, open source. All right. What is the current version of Angular JS? <laughs> If you give this answer to a teacher in a quiz, three, but four, but two, maybe two. <laughs> I don't think they want it to be referred to as four. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, this, cards. This is, this is a pretty hard question, so it deserves some more. So, AngularJS uh, was released, I don't know, a few years ago, right? And it was, you know, had versions like 1, 1 1.2, etc., till 1.6. And then they decided to completely rewrite the framework. And now the new version is called Angular, actually, like without the GS or Angular.io is the website. Um, and they did release version 2, so correct. And then they decided to skip version 3 for some naming reasons, naming conventions. And yes, version 4 is supposed to be released in uh, March 1st, on March 1st. So like next week almost, right? So yeah. That's where we are, and they are not backwards compatible. <laughs> That's one of the biggest pains of developers. Um, so what is the software design pattern that AngularJS uses? All right, anybody else? Yep. MVC. What is MVC? View controller. I'm going to throw a candy. 
Oh, <laughs> see, I need to work on my arm muscles, but yes, there are more kinjis downstairs, you can get them. Um, all right, so MVC, model view controller. The, <clears throat> excuse me. The pattern has been around for years, right? It's not something new that Angular invented. It separates model, the data. In Angular case, that's your scope object, the view, or the, the template, the HTML, the representation of the data, and then the controller is the code. What Angular did differently is that all of this is now on the client side. Like if you think of traditional, you know, Java, .NET applications, you have your service side code, you have your templates, which are usually some sort of, you know, HTML files, GSPs, whatever. Um, and then your model is the database. So the controller and the model are usually on the server side, where Angular puts all of this onto the client side. So that's different. Uh, and they also call it, so MVC or MVV, uh, VC, uh, MVVM, view model, so model view and then not a controller but a view model, it's kind of an enhanced view, or MVW, which is like model view whatever. So your controller, you, you can write code in whatever way you want, as long as you, but you are limited to have the model, which is the built-in scope object, and the view, which are the Angular templates. And then all of that on the client side interacts with the server side. Right, so that's kind of another layer here. Who invented and who maintains Angular? Google, Google maintains Angular, that's true. Whee! Almost there. <laughs> this audience is not, you know, good for throwing candy. Um, yeah, so invented by Mishko Haverly, I'm like afraid to butcher his name, the Polish researcher. Um, then he open sourced it and yes, Google supports it maintains it these days, which is again why Angular is so popular is because a lot of companies in the industry are not afraid to move to Angular because they know it's going to be around for a while, right? With, I mean, if you follow JavaScript world, there is a new framework every couple of weeks and then like three months later everybody forgets about this framework and then there's a new framework. So if you're a big business and you want to rewrite all your apps in this new framework, you kind of want to be sure that it's going to be there, that somebody's going to be fixing those vulnerabilities that we're going to be talking about, right? So maintenance is important. Um, what are the benefits of Angular? Why do people choose it? Except for, you know, okay, maintained by Google. Developers, vulnerability, I mean, from developer side, from security side, from operations. So being able to write everything in JavaScript, that you have JavaScript on the client and JavaScript on the server. Well, if you take another framework that's also front-end JavaScript framework, that like does, doesn't change anything, right? <laughs> so that, that's, that's a benefit of the kind of, if you choose J JavaScript for the server side, then yes, you are all full stack JavaScript and it's kind of easier. But anything else that Angular specifically gives you? So data binding, uh, two-way data binding out of the box, right? Again, like you, you can create data binding with other frameworks, but with Angular, just it's there, which means you change the data in the view, it automatically updates on the, on the um, um, front end, right? On, in, in, the, in the, I'm sorry, you change the data in the model, it, it automatically updates in the view. You change the data in the view as a user entering something, it automatically updates the model, so that's great. Single page applications, yep, and what else you said? Oh, dependency injection. How is that a benefit? Mm -hmm. Right, so you can inject your dependencies, and when we say dependencies, usually other plugins, other modules that give functionality um, into your controller like when you need them, right? You don't need to collect all the data, all the, all the dependencies, all the, you know, the libraries, and then write the code. We can, you can inject them on the fly, which also makes Angular fast, right? Did you have another thing? 
testable. Yes, testability is definitely. I'm not gonna throw candy, but you, <laughs> seriously, you can guys. I'm gonna leave them here. You can come back and pick them up. Um, yes, so it's super fast. It is very easy to test. So that, the, and especially for the client side framework, that is pretty new. The testability was usually, you know, a pain of existence for developers. So, and yeah, and performance is another really big one. All right. Um, so if AngularJS is on the front end, what do we have on the back end? No JS. Anything else? Okay, you can be serverless. What else? Yeah, Lambda on the back end. PHP, you can have whatever. It doesn't matter, right? You can have your old Java, you can have your PHP, you can have Python, you can be serverless, it doesn't matter, right? It's front end, as long as whatever is on your server side is talking web services, that's all you need, right? The rest, REST API, that, that's all you need. All right, what are the popular types of applications? And a, a um, paradigm of applications that we can build with Angular. Yeah, yeah what's SPA? Yeah, what you already mentioned. So what's what's good about server page apps? Yes. So you don't refresh the page every time. You don't like reload the whole page every time you refresh the data. So you use AJAX. You refresh just like parts of the page, and for the user, it looks like a like desktop application, right? So nothing. Nothing really. Cool. All right, so I have answers here just in case. I think we pretty much hit all the points. Um, yeah, like if we talk about the benefits, one thing we didn't mention is convenience in how, in how you manipulate the DOM, right? The view that, that that's also much easier with the framework. But yeah, pretty much we're good. So what is OWASP? What, what is OWASP? Anybody heard of OWASP here? Uh-huh, yeah. Project, yes, open, open Web Application Security Project. And what is the top 10 list that they come up with every couple of years? The list of most common security, I would say vulnerabilities, not the threats, right? Because threats is um, slightly different. Yes, it's a list of most common and they get the data from uh, vendors who do penetration testing and code analysis, right? So, and yes, it's not um, the ones that are more dangerous. Again, it's most common, so that's kind of important to understand. So, I would like to compare Angular, like how it applies to the OWASP top 10 list. And this is a list from 2013, which is the latest, which is crazy because we are in 2017, but they are kind of behind <laughs> no one updating the list. Um, because I've seen uh, courses kind of in the, in the industry that say, you know, oh, a was top 10 for Angular or, or talks. And I'm thinking, this is a client-side framework. It cannot have all of the was top 10 vulnerabilities. Like, this is just wrong. But let's, let's look at each of them and see if it actually applies. Um, so the first one in a WASP is injection. Uh, and usually when we talk about injections, we talk about yes, SQL injection, command injection, LDAP injection, right? Like in the first um, talk that when we talked about the ADs, you can also, instead of sending your password, you can send some malicious characters which are gonna actually change your LDAP query and have an injection. Does that apply to Angular? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Template, Template injection, right. So that, that, that's good. So because we don't have a database on the client side, so SQL injection doesn't really work. Command injection is com like usually operating system command. We are in the browser, so doesn't really work. Uh, LDAP, obviously not. Uh, but t template inject injection is one type that Angular has, and we'll we'll have a slide on that. We'll, we'll look at some examples. Um, broken authentication and session management. So, like bypassing, you know, login pages. Does it apply to a client side app? To a client side part of the app? No, it shouldn't. Where do you check if the password is the correct password? 
on the server, right? You shouldn't be checking that on the client because then it's definitely bypassable. So that doesn't really apply. Um, Cross-site scripting? Yes, like that's the one big, I mean, we are talking JavaScript, we are talking client side, so obviously all the injections into JavaScript are gonna end up with cross-site scripting. Well, not all, but like that's, that's the most common one. Insecure direct object reference. What is that? So you're accessing objects directly in the database instead of going through a getter, et cetera. I mean, you are accessing them anyways. What it says, um, direct object reference. The reference is kind of the key word here, is that if you access an object directly by an ID that is used in the database, for example. Why this is dangerous is because if I know this is the ID of my bank account, Right, the, that's the one that's used in the database, and then I can somehow find out what's your the ID of your bank account. Then I just switch the IDs and I have access to your bank account. Right? Instead, there should be some sort of mapping where it shows me on the website, you know, this is your account number, but it's not the same number that's used in the database. So there should be mapping. So does that apply to a front-end framework? Mm, again, checking that is on the server side. Right, you can change the IDs on the client side, but like the protection should be on the server side, so it should be in your Java code, into your in your PHP code. So that's not really um, security misconfiguration. Yes, it's a framework. It has features that you can turn on and turn off. If you turn the like security features off, obviously you're going to be broken. Sensitive data exposure. Uh, that's usually when we, you know, save those account numbers, for example display them on the client side or, you know, bank credit card numbers, display them on the client side. So on one hand, with the web page, I mean, you have to display those things for the user. If the user wants to see their account number, they have to see the account number. But what you shouldn't be doing is storing these things on the client side. And so Angular uh, gives you kind of a wrapper around the object that's called local storage in JavaScript. What uh, does local storage do? Keep stuff in the browser even when you log off the application. So that's um, the important kind of part, right? There, like in other places where you store in just the memory of the browser, you log off, you close your browser, you close your computer, data is gone, it's fine. With local storage, it's gonna be there persistent forever, so if anybody else uses the same computer, they can get data, kind of can, can get the, that information. Uh, missing function level access controls. Easier to say authorization. Does that apply to front end? What is authorization compared to authentication? Authorization is, authentication is you are who you are, authorization is what you can do, what is your role, what are your rights? So do we check the rights on the client side? We should not, right. So in this case, kind of right. I mean, if you do authorization on the client side in Angular, that's a problem. So you shouldn't be doing that. But it's funny, if you look up um, on like Stack Overflow, Angular authorization, there are articles that will tell you how to do that. And somewhere in the, you know, <laughs> fine print on the bottom, they're gonna say, oh, and by the way, you should also validate that on the server. But if, you <laughs> if you're a regular developer, you copy and paste stuff from over, Stack Overflow, it's gonna mean that you're gonna check all of your rights on the client side, and that's gonna be a problem. Oh, sorry, CSRF, we'll yes, it'll show it already. Um, what is CSRF? Cross-site request folder. Forgery. So another vulnerability where you can trick a user into submitting a request that they didn't want to submit um, and thus kind of cause havoc. So for example, um, I log into my Facebook and then somebody sends me an email and says, hey, look at this video of funny cats and I click on this link that I don't know, you know actually where it goes 
and I look at the video of funny cats, and then I go back to my Facebook, and they posted something under my account, right? Somehow stuff got posted, or my picture got updated, or, you know, and if it wasn't a Facebook, if it was like a banking site, then, of course, you can do much more harm. So Angular actually provides some protection from CSERF, um, again, which should be um, in confluence with the server part of the implementation, right? You can also, you should also check that stuff on the server side. Components with known vulnerabilities? Yes. So because Angular is an open source framework and there are all the plugins, if a plugin that you're using has a problem and you include it, then your application has a problem. So that's definitely an issue. And then unvalidated redirects and forwards? What is, what is, what is that? What's a redirect? You're sending a user from one website to another website, right? So basically, you're, you're creating a link that starts with your, you know, abertayuniversity.edu, and then there are some parameters, but then when the user clicks on it, the user is actually redirected to some malicious website. And so those are used in the phishing attacks, right? When somebody sends you an email, it looks like the link starts with the domain that you trust. But because there is problem in the code, when you click on it, you actually get redirected somewhere else. And then you don't check, you know, a usual user wouldn't check the URL all the time. And they end up on a different website and they're, you know, asked to provide their credentials or something else. And you can do that on the client side. So yes, so that applies. So these are kind of the things that you will talk about when you think about Angular security. You know, the other things don't really apply. So that's good to know. So let's look at the security things that are built into Angular out of the box. And those are the things that make Angular really, really cool, really good. So one thing is they have built-in output encoding, contextually aware output encoding, and um, strict contextual escaping. So those are two different things. By default, when you display some data on the page, depending on if this data is going to be inside your HTML, or if it's going to be in a URL, or if it's going to be in the, your CSS, for example, Angular will understand the context where the data is, and it's going to encode it in the right context. So here, for example, we are um, outputting something into the paragraph tag, into the P, right? And we have our, you know, go to take our controller, HTML controller.htm variable, and stick whatever is there into the page. So we're not applying any function that says, escape HTML, encode HTML, that's what you would do in your like traditional Java applications. Here, Angular will do this work for you and will end up with the, so if, if this code, if this value had some HTML characters, it would encode them and put, you know, less than, greater than, instead of your angle brackets, encode all the malicious characters. So in this case, in the result, the HTML characters are not gonna be executed by the browser. So there's not going to be any attack. So that's great. Then the second one is the strict contextual escaping. The encoding is good, but your user will see the HTML tags on the page. So from the usability perspective, that's not good. That's just, you know, not usable. Instead of having a username, it's going to see, you know, angle bracket I, for example, and then the angle bracket close I, et cetera. And that's not what we want. Sometimes as, as developers, especially as designers, we want to apply some, you know, fonts, some italics, some bold, some, put in some images. But we don't want to let the attacker put in any JavaScript in there, right? Anything malicious. So what Angular will do for you, it will automatically strip all the bad stuff and leave all the good stuff in there. And this is done with the strict contextual escaping. So again, based on the context, it's gonna, well, they call it escaping, but it's basically stripping or sanitizing your input. Um, it is enabled from version 1.2 of Angular and higher, hopefully you're not gonna use anything you know, lower than that. It didn't exist before that, 
Uh, you have to include module ng sanitize to, for it to be used. If you don't, you're going to see an error message in your console. So again, like, it's not a, if you don't include it, your, your code just won't work. So most likely you will include it. You can turn it off manually. You can do in your config of the application, um, SC provider enabled sets to false, which is then dumb because <laughs> this is a really good protection. And if you're doing something like that, then something is wrong. Or if you have to turn it off, you can turn it off with the um, SCE.trust as or trust as HTML function, and you will turn it, this protection off for one specific field. If you have this one field where you have to inject something that Angular will otherwise filter out, you can use that, but you better be sure that whatever you're inserting is you trust that code. It's not affected by an attacker because otherwise somebody can inject some malicious JavaScript and again cause a cross-site scripting there. All right. Come on. The next protection that Angular gives us out of the box, oh, my battery is dead, is content security policy. Anybody heard of content security policy? All right, <laughs> maybe, kind of. All right, content security policy, kinda, I'm going to give a really quick demo, and you can read about it later. But it is a new way of protecting your applications from cross-site scripting. The good thing about Angular is that it comes with this protection out of the box, where a lot of other frameworks do not support it. And the way it works, is that um, one of kind of a couple dangerous places with the client side JavaScript is one is inline scripts when your attackers can inject some JavaScript instead of you know putting your username in there. And then two is using an eval function because eval is evil. Never, never use eval. If you are evaluating uh, user code in the eval, that means you're basically executing user code on like as your code that you completely trust that user or that attacker was in. And the way Angular works is that you can't turn off eval inside the framework. The problem with other frameworks like um, jQuery, for example, they rely on eval. So if you turn it off, your application is going to break. With Angular, you can turn it off. It's going to make your application slower. So you have, sometimes you have to take the risk. Um, maybe you say, well, I cannot allow a 30% delay on my application because it's already so big and 30% really like slows things down. Um, then you just, you just have to use eval and that's fine. You can do that. But if you, if your application is well written, you can turn it off. So, so by default, if you don't provide anything about the CSP, in, when you um, start your Angular app, you just do body ng app. It will um, it will check if eval is allowed by your policy. Then it's going to use it. If it's not allowed, it's not going to use it, and it's going to be slightly slower and slightly more secure. The other thing um, you can set here is inline styles. So we talked about inline scripts, and they are super dangerous. Uh, you can also have your styles, your CSS either in line or in a separate file. Having them in line, although they are CSC styles, they shouldn't be dangerous, but they are actually what they are called scriptless attacks. And I have some links here. Mario Heydrich wrote an amazing paper about it. Um, so they may be dangerous, so you may want to turn it off. Again, that only affects your presentation, your style. So depending on how you're doing your design, you may totally do without those inline styles. You can just put all your CSS into a file and you'll be fine with that. And so here are the different configurations that you can do with Angular. You can like turn off eval or turn on the styles and turn off the styles and turn on eval, depending on what you need as a developer. The other protection or kind of protection um, that Angular gives, if you, you know, if you read about Angular, they say, oh, there is a sandbox bypass, or there is a sandbox thing. So Angular versions from 1 till 1.6 all had something that was called a sandbox that basically said, 
JavaScript that you're running in your Angular app is executed on the scope object, on the specific built-in object, and not on the whole DOM, not on the whole you know, model of your application, which the idea was to just separate your view and your controller, but it kind of worked as a security protection because you couldn't just do an alert. If you do, you know, script, script, alert, what Angular is actually going to do is going to call the scope object and then try to call alert on a scope object, which doesn't exist and it's not going to work. So a lot of attacks, a lot of traditional attacks wouldn't work here. But every version from, you know, 1.0 to 1.5 point, whatever the last, last one, 1.5.8, um, had a sandbox escape. So the sandbox was not written well enough and every ver every next version they tried to patch that escape, you know, protect a little bit more, and they were still saying that uh, the sandbox is not a security measure. So if you find an escape, it's not a zero-day vulnerability. <laughs> Which, it's kind of funny, like, well, we don't really have problems in our code because it's not meant to be protecting you, it's just a feature, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, and you can go and like, so um, look up the exploits, they're open, you know, they're, they're known, just look up Angular sandbox escapes and you just, you know, copy paste the code and it works, right? Nothing crazy about it. So like one example payload, it looks pretty crazy. You call constructor.prototype and char it and all these functions in specific order, but it works and at the end it pops up your, you know, alert box and we'll see an example here. But then, finally, at Angular 1.6, Angular they said, all right, we're going to remove the sandbox. We don't have it anymore. It's not a protection. Here, <laughs> kind of forget about it. So there is no sandbox, really. And then the last feature that is built into Angular by default is the protection from that CSERF, the cross-site request forgery. Um, so the way it works is that when a user submits a request, for example, I want to transfer money, money from one account to another account, right? The server needs to know that this request actually came, was initiated from me, from, from the user, not that just it came from my browser and has my cookie, but that I actually went into the application, selected the two accounts, the, you know, the, the number, and I am the one who said, who clicked submit. Because if I am logged into my account, and at the same time, I'm clicking on some malicious link that came in the email, the another website that is open in a different tab can actually send a post request to my bank account and have all the same information, you know, the from account to account um, amount confirm, and my browser will attach my cookie automatically, so to the server, uh, to the bank, it's gonna look like I am the one who sent the request, so that's how CSERF works, right? To protect from that, what applications do is on the server they generate a special token that the attacker cannot read, and then with each request you send this token that's unique to this, to my session right now, and they validate this token and it's like, okay, well, that actually came from you because the attacker couldn't guess that token, right? It should be long enough. So what Angular gives you for free is if your server side creates this token and sends it to the client side as a cookie, Angular will take the cookie, and it should be named in a specific way, XSRF token, um, write a header to your request. And so then you have the same token in the cookie and in the HTTP header, and submit all of that to the server side. So then the server side will check if the header matches the cookie. And if they match, that means the request came from the legitimate user, the request can go through. If it's just the cookie, because um, if it was a malicious request, then the cookie will be always attached automatically by your browser, but the mal again, the malicious attacker cannot read the cookie and cannot write the request, uh, the, the HTTP header. Uh, to your request because of the limitations of like how browsers work, because, because of the same origin policy. Uh, but again, this validation, if these two tokens still match, should happen on the server side. 
So that's why when I talked about um, cross-site request forgery, I put a question mark, right? So Angular helps you to protect from it, but it doesn't do all the work. You still have to do the final part on the server side yourself. So that, that comparison and the generation of the tokens and the comparison of the tokens. And again, I have some links um, that explain these things in more detail for you to understand. So, so far it looks like everything, you know, there we go, now it works. <laughs> that um, every, Angular is pretty secure, right? But there are still problems with the framework. So for example, um, there are DOM XSS, so cross-site scripting or XSS, and there is kind of new version of cross-site scripting well, it's been around for five years, so I guess it's not new anymore. We call it DOM-based. The DOM is the document object model, um, the model of your data in the browser. So it only has to do with the data in the browser, not on the server side. And of course, because Angular is all client side, it's all front end, that's where the injections happen. So let's look at how this can happen. So one is, um, we already talked about it, the trust as HTML. I mean, if you say that you trust this input that's coming from the user and the input is actually untrusted, I mean, unvalidated, then you may have an injection in your code, but this is because of the way the function is called, like you are the developer, you say, I'm trusting this data. If this data is bad, then that's your problem. <laughs> um, then another example is Angular has a built-in module called angular.element. And it basically does the same things as jQuery does. Um, so it allows you, again, to manipulate your elements, your, your DOM tree. And some of the functions in that module are vulnerable to injections. So for example, the, um, uh, the function after, after and before. So in this case, we have a, a user input right into this ele element after input. And then in our Angular code, what we do is we take the value uh, of that input, uh, here, scope after input, and then we go through the tree, we find the, you know, take our element document zero, so that's our main document, and then we find the element that has an ID of test div, and this is this div element here, and instead of this name, we are replacing it, we, we're, um, not instead of the name, but we are trying to put the, the value of the input that we received from the uh, user after that element. So element.after is going to actually inject another element into your page and modify your DOM. So in this case, if the value of after submit was not, uh, oh, sorry, after input was not validated, you can inject whatever. You can inject script, you can inject another like iframe, and so you can cause an, an injection by this way, in, in this way. So ideally, that should be sanitized with ng sanitize, but it's not. Like that's kind of where the problem is. You can't call ng sanitize the, the sanitize function of the ng sanitize module manually, and then that's how you fix this problem. But out of the box, Angular doesn't do that. I don't know why, for some reason. So if we don't sanitize, that's what we get. If we try to inject something like element P with on mouse over event, and then on this event we um, pop up an alert box, it's gonna show us an error message, an alert. The next vulnerability is, again, the, the other ones that I will be talking about are not inside the Angular itself. It's pretty well written overall, but inside the framework, inside the plugins or modules that you can include. So for example, you want to include the module that's called Angular Translate. What it does, it allows you to do the internationalization of your website, so you can have a map that has different you know, values in different languages for the same parameter. So for example, like for hello, right, you can put the word hello in different languages. And then by switching the language, your whole page changes the, uh, the way it looks. But that module um, will, so it will include some of the built-in um, text, 
that you're providing. So for example, hello and hello for German, uh, plus the text that you input, right? So here we can want to say hello, you know, user John. So that text that you input will be validated if you set the sanitization, uh, the sanitization strategy. But if you didn't, then it's not going to be validated. Again, it's going to take something from the user. The user logs in, you ask, what is your name? And instead of putting the name, the user is going to send you some JavaScript. If you don't validate it, it's going to be injected. By default, the strategy is null, so it's not going to escape or validate it by default. And also, if you do say uh, translation, uh, translate sensitization dot use strategy empty and you don't send anything, you again, you're setting it to null. So then you're going to end up with a problem. But if you do set it to something uh, good, like escape or sanitize, it's going to do these things. So again, kind of this module is not vulnerable by itself. It's only if you didn't configure it correctly, then it's going to have an issue. So yeah, same thing, you know, if we're, if we're trying to inject something instead of the name. Here, right. Um, so instead of the name, I'm just saying, instead of Bob, I'm say, saying Bob script alert, and then, you know, alert XSS, and the screen is going to pop up. Another example is uh, text Angular, which is another module. It's a what you see, what you get. Uh, text editor, right? So same, kind of same thing. If you're using this module, you're inputting the text, and in the text, if you are injecting some JavaScript, and then you want to preview the page that you are trying to, you know, create, the script is going to execute. Right? Unfortunately, for in this case, you cannot fix it. It's just, well, unless you rewrite the whole plugin. Uh, but that's the vulnerability in the plugin itself. There is no way to say, to set some sort of synthesization strategy or something like that. It's basically, if we see that our clients are using that, we would recommend them to use a different plugin instead. There is a um, ng-wig and there are like a couple other text editors that can be used, in st used instead. But usually for any module third-party plugin, you can check if um, it has any vulnerabilities when you go on GitHub and you look at the issues and you just Google and see, you know, are there any problems with this module that I'm going to use? And another example is a type ahead plugin. Again, not Angular itself, but a third party plugin. Uh, it's used for like when you're typing your search in Google, you know how it comes up with the suggestions as, as you're typing. So that's what the type ahead plugin does. Um, so it takes an array of elements. In this case, we call it searchers. Um, and then when you add this plugin, you say, you know, show me elements in, the, in this searches array, right? As you're, as you're typing, it's going to uh, populate that drop down under your search field. So if you don't validate, if you're taking um, the, the values for these searchers from the attacker, or for example, from the URL, if you're sending them in the URL, to this page because the, um, the searches will be different depending on what the user is searching for, right? So you may have a huge list on the server side and you want to dynamically update them so that your pages, you know, without refreshes, refresh shows you all these different searches. So if they're not validated, they may have a vulnerability. So let's look at the demo for this one actually. So in this case, I have a, a search box, and you can see that I'm actually sending some parameters here in the URL. So after the question mark, and instead of sending the kind of normal value for the search, I'm sending some JavaScript for sure. So what's going to happen if I start typing? If I start typing. Typing.
So in the drop down, and if I'm, so what, what do I need to do to have the JavaScript executed? Based on the URL, if you can see what I'm sending to the URL. Mouse over. So the event that I'm using is on mouse over. If I'm not mousing over, nothing happens, right? But if I mouse over here, the JavaScript that the um, the handler that I wrote is actually, you know, show this alert message. So that's what happens. So all of the examples that we usually use for cross-site scripting, we just pop up a simple alert box. But obviously, you can do more malicious things instead, you know, not just not just an alert box. So. So, um, the next one is the template injection. So, template injection is something very, very specific for Angular, and um, not just for Angular, but for applications that use templates on the server side and on the client side. Again, a template is, you know, when you have your HTML text, and then in, in your HTML, you have some, um, some way of putting server data or the, the dynamic data into that HTML before you are displaying it to the user, right? If you are using a server-side template, that's what we were doing for years before Angular existed, right? And if you're using, for example, JSPs in uh, Java, Smart in PHP, and like there are a ton of different templates, then you generate your HTML pages on the server, and then you display them. Sometimes what developers want to do is they want to combine the server-side templates and the client-side templates. And the client-side would be Angular. So, for example, inside your JSP page, you're going to have a section, a div, that actually has an Angular template in, you know, it's some Angular code, and that will be rendered by the Angular um, engine in the browser. So there are kind of two rendering stages. First, on the server-side, then you generate this template, send it to the client-side, render on the client-side, and then you display it to the user. The problem here is that um, the server-side templates, they usually protect you from cross-site scripting because they don't allow the malicious characters like angle brackets, like double quotes, like single quotes, and you check everything, it's like, all right, looks good. But what is the special character that Angular uses for the Angular expressions? The double curly braces, right? As a teacher, I have all the answers on the slides. <laughs> Usually, if there is a question, the answer is on the slide, right? So the double curly braces are not considered to be dangerous. Well, they were not before. But now, you can inject something with the double curly braces, and then when you have Angular engine rendering on the client side, they're going to treat those um, statements as commands and execute them. They are going to be executed as Angular expressions, not as JavaScript, right? But still, you can do a lot of harm. So again, what happens is you have server-side and client-side. You have the server-side template engine, and they have your client-side template engine. On the server-side, you have your template, you have your user input, you um, clean your user input, right? you sanitize it, you make sure there are no angle breakets, there's no JavaScript injected. And then you send it to the client side, but then maybe there is something injected with the double curly braces, which is an, an Angular command. And then the Angular um, engine renders the template and then you know, displays it to the user, and if it has some malicious commands, then it's going to execute them as well. How dangerous will that be? Like we said, it was like, it's not really JavaScript injection. It's, it is an Angular template injection. So you can only do something that Angular does. Can you manipulate the DOM with the Angular expressions? What do you guys think? So we said that Angular separates sandboxes your DOM, right? You can only do what Angular allows you to do. You cannot directly manipulate the DOM. Which is when you can manipulate the DOM, that's like, that's really a problem. So are you protected? With a sandbox? Mm -hmm. 
there is an escape. <laughs> exactly. So yes, the sandbox is there, but in every version there's either an escape or there, then there's no sandbox like in Angular point two, uh, or version two, right? So yes, you're not really protected. Good. Somebody was paying attention. <laughs> so let's look at another demo, how that actually works. So this is a vulnerable by design application, one of the apps that we're using in our training. So it is an Angular application, so it has like a list of bookmarks that you can create, and we can search for these bookmarks. So if we search for you know, user test created something, and we can see there is a bookmark. All right, so that search box is user input. Um, and the other thing we can see is that whatever I'm typing in the search will then end up in the um, in the URL, right? And that's usually the key for us, like as a pen tester, you want to exploit that because you can send this URL to anybody, right? Because you cannot trick your friend to put something into the search box. I mean, with some social engineering, you maybe can, but the link is very easy. You just email and say, hey, look at this you know, funny video or something. So what can we do? So I want to see if it actually executes some Angular expressions. So I'm going to send an Angular expression. So I'm going to do, you know, two curly braces, and I say, you know, two plus one, and search for that. What, we'll, what we can see is that we're actually searching for three, right? Which gives us an indication that Angular executed the two plus one. So that's one of the things that Angular expressions can do. They can do simple mathematical expressions. Right? Okay, so there is an injection. So how can we exploit it? Well, without, first we're not going to break out of the sandbox, right? First we're going to do something malicious that we can do with the Angular itself. So we know there is some client-side code here. Um, again, if you were an attacker, you would just like open up the JavaScript here because it's on the client side and look at the code, what they're actually doing, and try to exploit the logic. So I know already in this application that there is an object called user. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to send user equals undefined. And say search. And notice I was logged in as user test test. And now I'm not logged in at all. Now there is a sign in button, the sign up button, there's no data because suddenly it logged me out. Because I said user is undefined. So in this browser, in this session, now the user is undefined. So here's an attack, right? It's not horrible, but it's kind of an inconvenience. Well, I have to log in again. Uh, maybe the way to, like, what an attacker would really do is exploit that and then um, also send a link in the, like, in the email. It will be something like, you know, click on this link to check your user profile. If you're not able to log in, click on this link and you know, provide a username and password. And then the second link will actually not be to your website, but will be to the attacker website, but which is gonna look just like your website, and then you're providing username and password to somebody else, like you know, a double step phishing attack. The interesting thing, though, is that if I refresh the page completely, if I do a five and reload everything from the, from the server, on the server I'm still logged in. So when it refreshes, I'm back into my test test, you know, um, profile, and I can go back and I can see, you know, my user here, my profile here. I can go back to bookmarks. So it's only client side attack. Can I delete my session? Um, you can delete your session on the client, but not on the server, right? So. So, so, well, to delete your session, you would have to delete your session cookie, right? Assuming that you're using cookies. Um, so a couple of things. Y you, first, to access the cookie object, you will have to break out of the sandbox. So you'll have to use one of those, you know, sandbox escapes and then just say cookie equals empty string and then you lost your cookie. Uh, and th for this, your cookie has to be 
not protected from the HTTP, not have the HTTP only flag. Because usually we recommend to set this flag because then you cannot manipulate this cookie with the, with the JavaScript. But if both these conditions work, then yes, that, that's possible. But again, in this case, you deleted the cookie from the um, browser. So yeah, so you will, you will force the user to log in again. Because even if you, um, so if you do a five and you load the page completely from, you know, not, not cached, but completely from the server, actually the server will send you the cookie again because the, it still exists on the server side. Because the session on the server side hasn't been, has not been closed. So yeah, so you can kind of log you off temporarily. Uh, but now that we know that there are sandbox uh, protections, so if we try to do something like alert, another example, do um, alert one, for example. It's not gonna do anything, right? Because what it's trying to do is to execute alert on the scope object, which is a built-in Angular object. But if we use one of those bypasses that are well known, that I had on the slides, then we're actually able to manipulate the DOM itself, and now we have the error message you know, pop up. And so if we can do alert, in this case, then we can do document.cookie equals empty and like remove the cookie. So that's basically brings us to the end, and gosh, I did run to the whole hour. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so is Angular a good framework? What do you think? Yeah. Usually I get a question like, okay, well, if it's so broken, why, sh why should we use it? But it's actually pretty good. It's pretty secure. Again, the vulnerabilities that I demonstrated are mostly in the plugins. So if you're using plugins, check first how broken they are, right? How, or like, do they have any problems? Uh, and if they don't, then you're good. If you're separating your templates and you're not combining the server side and the client side templates, you're good. And you do get a lot of benefits. You know, it's, it's fast, it's testable, it's, it's pretty awesome. So we have like one more minute for questions. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, if you're running Node, the server, the JavaScript on the server side, and you're using plugins and dependencies, one plugin will de will depend on another plugin that will depend on another plugin, and then you may have a situation where you are bringing some vulnerable code into your app that you don't even know, right? In Angular, because the dependency tree is not as deep, usually the plugins may have like maybe one or two dependencies. So they don't have, you know, 25 dependencies down. So you know a little bit better what you are including. But I think that's also because Angular is newer and it's smaller. So if it grows bigger, then you may end up with the same, with the same problem. Uh -huh. so, one more question. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so in Node, you've got, um, this tag launch system before now, and you've got the, the NSP, and that looks really good with the audits. Yeah. So the question was uh, Node again. If you're using Node, because it's uh, the pa the uh, the platform has been used for a long time, and there are a lot of uh, packages. They have something that's called NSP uh, Node Security Project that audits all the plugins. And if there is a vulnerability, you you can you know go to NSP.com and look them up. Is there anything like that for Angular? No. <laughs> the answer is no. It is created by Google. So there, I, as far as I know, there isn't any like one location. Um, there are a couple blog posts and like websites that try, just individual people try to collect this information. Uh, but usually if you just use a plugin, you have to go to GitHub, you go to issues and you kind of search through issues and see if there are any security issues. Yeah, unfortunately we don't have anything like that. Yes, question is, can you use the breakout, the sandbox breakout that we showed to defeat the cross-site request forgery cookie mechanism? Absolutely. So one thing you have to remember with a cross-site request forgery 
is that if you have a cross-site scripting, and that's your cross-site scripting, nothing's going to protect you. So, because basically the way cross-site request forgery protects you is it says, yes, you have the cookie, but you have to be able to execute the JavaScript on the client side to read this cookie and to create this header and send it to the server. And if you have a JavaScript injection, you can do that. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So the first, if you, like, if you are a developer and you get a report from, you know, some third party company that pen tested your app and says, hey, you have a cross site scripting and you have a CSERF, first thing you, ch you fix is cross site scripting. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, no. If, the question was if, if the app vulnerable by design was open source. No, unfortunately, this is something that we use in our um, instructor-led trainings, which is a service we provide as a company, so it's our IP. But, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to uh, restrain you guys from going and having lunch. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>